very much. As you know, local government elections are scheduled for June 12th of this year. And many of you would be following the several attempts by GCOM to hold these elections. But each of those attempts being stymied by the three opposition council, um, commissioners. I think the strategy was to give the PNC time to prepare for these elections because we all recognize that they're only prepared to contest any elections whatsoever given the sordid past that they've recently emerged from in government. And so they have been busy going around the country trying to seek candidates, put together a list to contest these elections. And it has not been, they have not received a very favorable response from many parts of the country. And that difficulty in putting together a credible campaign to contest in all the local government bodies was reflected today in the comments by Mr. Norton when he said, oh, they're working on a dual approach. They're preparing, but they're not sure they will contest as yet, but they may contest in some areas because they don't want the PPP to overwhelm their strongholds. And so the ambiguity is not because it's a strategic thinking. It's largely because of the difficulties they are faced with on the ground in putting together a list of candidates to contest in all of the areas. As you recognize in 2018, when they were in office spending tons of state money, had the entire media, state media, at their disposal, they could not even put contests in every part of the country. We in opposition at that time, we contested in every single local government body and we intend to do the same again. So often when, when parties go to elections, people should look at their track record. Um, in this country, it's slightly different. But we would like all of the analysts that have now been rife in our country and they, they've proliferated like mushrooms to, to look at our track record and do some comparisons of the track records of the parties contesting the elections. We're very proud of our track record and our fealty to the manifesto, the promises that we made to the people of the country, historically and in the last elections. And so if you see, and we hope that that analysis would be done by many in the media and elsewhere, because that's the only way you can really determine if a party would remain faithful to its promises. Now, since we're approaching the election season, and this is the first time in a major way that I'm speaking as General Secretary of the People's Progressive Party, I, it, it behoves me now to go back just briefly to the past maybe two and a half, three years. Uh, most of you would recognize that we, we got into office under very difficult circumstances. We had to fight off aggressively through the courts, through street protests, through maneuvering, through the help of the international community and a, a, a national campaign of mobilization, an attempt to steal the last elections. And that battle quietly raged on for five months. It, uh, we came into office with that behind us. We came into office 
with no budget since November of 2018, and the government at that time having unauthorizedly spending 420 billion Guyana dollars or over 2 billion US dollars. That was the second major hurdle we had to overcome. The third was there was no plan for health care, no plan for job creation, no plan for infrastructure. In fact, no plan for anything. If you look at it, if you look at the PNC's manifesto and their public utterances, there were no new plans for any highways or the power plants for the future or any hospitals. There was zero. Um, we had a broken procurement system where the ministers openly violated, openly violated the procurement rules of the country, taking to the cabinet directly um, contracts which was in violation of our procurement law. And that was a routine um, matter. In fact, one minister is now charged for doing that. It's before the courts because he took an unsolicited bid to the cabinet by passing the tender board. Um, the cabinet cannot award contract. It can only give a no objection. Um, the PPP, when I was president, we put that in law that the cabinet only has a no objection role. But he, the cabinet in that period approved the contract and then they implemented it utilizing funds from the Harbor Bridge. That is the study that Patterson is charged for for the, for the three lane bridge across the river. But that was a routine thing. The procurement system was broken to. And then, of course, we came into office with the country being shut down because of COVID. And subsequently, as a con we felt the reverberation of the shutdown because um, you had major shortages around the world and it led to unprecedented levels of cost of living increases across the world. We manage in Guyana. If you look at our, the regional average for inflation and compare to many developed jurisdictions, because of the measures we took here in Guyana, we managed to remain below many of those averages and to, to emerge from that period without major welfare losses to our people, unlike what happened in other countries which led to many street protests. So it was under those circumstances we took office. As you would recognize, very, very difficult circumstances, emerging from no democracy, no uh, having to fix a budget after having no budget for such a long time and fixing all the illegalities, the illegal spending that APNU made without the budget, having to address COVID without any capacity to deal with it at that time, having to deal with the subsequent cost of living increases and then putting together the plans. And I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to say our party remained faithful, the government remained faithful to the manifesto. And in spite of all those challenges, we implemented all of our promises, or nearly all of our promises. Reduction of taxes, you saw that I was removing, reversing, and removing many of the taxes that had become a humbug to welfare growth and to the growth of industries. I'm not going to enumerate those because there are nearly 200 of those taxes and fees that we reversed or we reduced. We then restored many of the welfare programs that APNU had cut um, for the children, for pensioners, the water subsidy for pensioners, all of those were restored in that period. We started rebooting the economy by removing taxes and giving incentives to the private sector, and we've seen the consequences of that, that the non-oil economy started growing once again. Uh, and we also put together a job creation plan, 
some of it temporary. We started building homes that was not part of our manifesto promise, but led to major amounts of employment in people who are building these homes as part of the rebooting of the economy, the part-time program, and then, of course, the natural expansion in the economy led to tens of thousands of new jobs being created, which was one of our manifesto promises. We put together 12 new hospitals that are going to start this year, unprecedented, zero plan there when we got into office. Now we'd have 12 new hospitals, and this is in a sh very short historical period. Five new highways are under construction. We have a power supply. We are going to fix power supply in this country once and for all with a project that we have started already in the, in the last two and a half, three years that will see electricity prices not come, by, come down by 50%. Cooking gas prices come down maybe by the same magnitude, and also stable power. And that has been put together all in this period. And then, of course, massive help to address cost of living um, increases and to help the productive sectors of our economy, the fishermen, the farmers, and many other interest groups. So all of this happened in this short period that we have been in office in spite of all of the challenges we had with COVID and everything else, this shutdown of the country. And, and therefore, you can understand my sense of pride as General Secretary of this party when, when I say that we've remained faithful to what we campaign on and looking out for the interests of the people. In the oil and gas sector, I've seen a lot of people today, they talk about us wheeling and dealing at their press conference. But we have redone all of the environmental permits that they did. And today, anyone who looks at an environmental permit, compare it, which are all now in the public domain. We have published those that were not published from the first two that were given for the first two projects. We have published every single one. If you compare the two, you will see how, how close ours is to international standards. As I said before, um, and another press conference when I spoke with government-related matters, we've strengthened almost all of the provisions in those environmental permits. Secondly, we have we have restructured the, the sovereign wealth fund. Today, we have one of the greatest, in terms of transparency, sovereign wealth fund. In terms of transparency. So I saw some so-called economists from, from Jamaica saying, oh, Guyana doesn't have the institutional capacity to deal with corruption. Therefore, it will fall prey to the resource course. Well, the resource, this is not an economist. The resource curse problem has to do more with the Dutch disease and not corruption. But let us assume for a moment he's correct, but he's not correct. The resource curse had to do with something else in economic terms, not corruption. It's about the Dutch disease. But assuming he's correct, correct he should read the Sovereign Wealth Fund amendments and see what was there before. No country in the world will put their Minister of Finance in jail for 10 years if he doesn't publish within three months of receipt of any money from any oil company it in the public, the, that, that receipt in the public domain, in the official Gazette and notify the Parliament. No country will do that in the world. And we have that. So. We, we have now put out a new PSA, which would fix many of the problems of the past. We have changed the fiscal terms of the, uh, of the Stabrook PSA from 2% royalty to 10% royalty, zero taxes, corporate tax to 10% tax, and a 65% on the cap for cost recovery. If that's wheeling and dealing, you want more of that. 
because APNU wasn't wheeling and dealing, but they had a bad environmental permit, a crappy um, PSA, and they didn't go to auction. We're going to auction now for the blocks. So that is what the government has been engaged in, greater transparency. I just say this study, I don't want to belabor this. This is a party's press conference, but to show progress in almost every single area that we've touched. The agriculture agenda is widely expanded in this country. This is all in the last three years. So um, as I said before, we're in local government, we're approaching elections. And when you approach elections in this country, you have some common things that happen historically. I've been around for a while, so I know this. I've seen it happening again. So the first thing is that APNU is trying to, to redirect us from away from the history that they have, a history of stealing elections. There's been no period in this country when APNU has been in office that they didn't steal or attempt to steal an election. That is their legacy. No, not a single period for the nearly 30 years they've been in office, 30, 33 years they've been in office, where they have not stolen or attempted to steal an election. And that has not changed and will not change with this current crop of leaders. It's part of their DNA now. So no, no big talk, and they live the fallacy. They're the only ones who live this fiction that people believe that they didn't attempt to steal the last elections. They live that. You, can, you have seen publicly the embarrassing attempts to, to explain their loss and their attempt to steal the elections by fictitious Russians manipulating how people voted. And imagine those people are still there making comments and people, some people, or maybe the, the lunatic French can, would be the only ones who will take them with an, a modicum of credibility, a Ramjatan or a Kati Yus, who said, oh, the Russians came in and tried to steal the elections. People, people Forget that, well, we will remind them. We will remind this country because if we don't know that, if we don't can't, can't remember that and it happened just two and a half years ago, then this place has no future. We'll remind them about these characters and their role in trying to steal the elections. Look at the embarrassment of about their statements of poll. They have it, they don't have it, it's hidden away. It's in some boxes in the Letem's office now, somewhere else. Embarrassment. This is from a major party, and they still hang on to the fiction that they won the elections. And they, and, and they actually go around talk, saying this in many communities. Then the next feature of this era is to roll out roll out the fossils. So we have seen this many, many times before, where the fossils, the fossils emerge around the election time. Now, let me, let me make it clear. If you need a definition of fossils, it's not just a function of age, although a lot of the individuals here I'm talking about are in their 80s. But it's also the, a fossil, in my view, oh, the people I call fossils. It's not, is one that they live in a historical era where they have been not just complainers, but many of them have been past, uh, had a history of anti national sentiments. Two, I think they're jealous of young people inheriting this country. 
because they have lived their lives in bitterness and they don't want to see the progress and the next generation. They know what's coming their way. A life full of exciting possibilities, etc. And these jealous fossils live their lives, they become bitter. Thirdly, and this is a very important characteristic of these fossils, they lack integrity. So today, another fossil was rolled out, Hamilton Green, to appear at a press conference to talk about our history. <laughs> Hamilton Green has had the most destructive in impact and influence on our history. If I there is a, I don't think one good thing could be associated with Hamilton Green in the long period that he has been in office. In, in every capacity, as prime minister and mayor, he was at the center of stealing elections in this country. So he is no, imagine if you have to go back to an 88 year old person, Norton has to go back to him to seek it to seek um, inspiration and to support your cause. A man who has no track record of goodness in this country. So he talks about, he came out to say that Chedi Jagan must not be called the father of the nation. Now, frankly speaking, people will characterize there is no national designation as father of the nation. People feel from different parties that their leaders probably made the most impact in the history. But he wants to denigrate the role, denigrate the role of Chedi, Chedi Jagan. And, and we never allow that to happen. How could Bur and so he said Burnham is the father of the nation, and until now, Hamilton Green cannot answer. Burnham was on the CIA's payroll until 1970. This is public knowledge now, four years after he was prime minister of an independent nation. And, and the role that they played in the, he talks about independence and the role that Hamilton Green played in that period. So Hamilton Green has been rolled out now as one of the fossils of the past election season to help Norton, uh, he's bereft, who is bereft of ideas, dynamism, char charisma, everything else. He has no leadership skills, so they rolled him out. So other fossils have been coming out Anan Gulsaran, another fossil. Suddenly I see him appearing. We have seen um, a, a, a number, so the Ogun Sears and the David Hines and all of them, that's how I characterize this group of people. And they're all rolling out. And then, and then they have some allied organizations. These are uh, the APA and the others. If you go back and look at the history of Ghana, the wrong election season, they all become, they all become active. And so when I saw the public comments by Ogun Seir and David Hines, as dangerous as they are, I, it, it's part of what they are historically, the, these organizations. The WPA has be, became defunct when Walter Rodney died. And I'm sure that many of these individuals who are speaking today contributed to the death of Walter Rodney. They probably helped collaborated with the PNC in killing Walter Rodney. And that has been established now by a commission of inquiry that the PNC killed Walter Rodney 
who is the leader of the WPA and one of the most preeminent scholars in the world, that the PNC snuffed out his life, assassinated him. This is the same WPA that tried when the report went to parliament, voted against the report being considered in the parliament. And they did this all because they had cushy jobs in government. Rupert Rupnorain, Clive Thomas, Ogun Sayer was working at SARA as a forensic auditor. I don't know where he got any skills, but was making Ogun Sayer was getting a cushy set of money in SARA as an auditor. And David Hines, a forensic auditor too. I don't know what he Anyhow, let me don't go into that. So, 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 and David Hines. It is this loss of privilege that there and, and pecuniary kind of circumstances, they were getting free money for doing nothing practically from the public purse that they're reacting to. So to show that they still have relevance they normally do the shock therapy. They go out and make outrageous comments and hope that the outrageous comments will trigger a public outcry and they get their names mentioned and the WPA suddenly comes alive back on paper. And that is precise, that's their modus operandi and they triggered it again now, these are pure law and order issues. It doesn't require just public condemnation, and, and there's been adequate public condem condemnation from people and organizations that have integrity. But the police have to deal with these. The moment they are made, these are illegal acts, and the police need to nip them in the bud immediately because they do this for the public, the outrage, the, the, val the outrageous value that has a benefit to them. But when they're faced with the law of the country, they break the law, the police have to descend as quickly as possible, file the cases and charge these individuals. Because if other people do it, the police will, will go after them. They have to go on, a uh, this is a law and order issue. And it requires immediate action, and you will see how quickly Many of them will retreat, how they will retreat. So this is typical of the modus operandi, a, a dead organization trying to resurrect itself once again by making these wild statements. But you know what is revealing? What, it's good that it happened because it's revealing to, and it's, it's just another bit of evidence to show how racist, how racist not just the WPA has become, but APNU, ha, that it's part, APNU not only become, but how APNU is. So the, the statements were made, and four persons, uh, after that, the outrageous statements about in Indians living in pipes, coming from, from India and living in pipes and being brought to this country and stuff like that. So four of the APNU Indo, Indo Guyanese members condemn it. But what, what effectively they were condemning, I think, was their own leader, Norton, they said in that statement that the speakers who spoke after that individual who made that should have corrected the, the statement or condemned it. Now, who spoke after the individual? Norton did. So effectively, they were saying that Norton did not do so. That Norton failed to condemn it. So we subsequently saw other statements, and then David Hines 
came out and he he said that one of the former general secretaries of the PNC was a slave catcher. And now everybody should condemn this too. Norton, today when asked about it at his press conference, he said he didn't see it as yet. Isn't there a familiarity, a, a, a trend that runs here? The GHRA, another Mike McCormack, another fossil of the past. The, he said when asked about the condemnation, he didn't read that as yet. So Norton didn't see the slave catcher's comment. But let me tell you something. And so Norton today, in his statement, when asked by the notorious Adam Harris, they said, oh, the PPP is racist. Well, let me say to Norton, one, Mr. Norton has seen off in the short period. It hasn't been a year since he has been general secretary of that party. And he has seen off two indo guyanese general secretaries from that party, women, both women. And he has had another person condemn, call her this David Hines, this woman, indo guyanese woman, a slave catcher, without a comment from him, without a comment from him, him or defending her. So he's seen off two general secretaries and a treasurer in less than one year as leader of the opposition. But we should not go very far. Who am I to talk about Norton like this? You should listen to Roysdale Ford himself. Roysdale Ford, when he was contest supporting Harmon, he said publicly that if Norton becomes the general secretary, not the leader of the PNC, the PNC will become a racist organization. That is Roysdale Ford talking about Norton. Now they complain a lot about racism and everything else, but it is another tool. I've seen them setting up a new organization to condemn, to, to fight racism, another institute here, mirroring the institute that the other, the criminal who is ensconced in the US trying to extort people, Rick Ford Bork, here, he has an institute, and no doubt they're, they're impregnated by the similar idea that this could work in Guyana, but we'll expose it. This institute that they just created, um, it was launched in West Coast Barbies a couple of days ago to fight, fight discrimination. Roysdale Ford was the main speaker. So I'm hoping that they will do this. They went to complain to the U.S. about, about um, racism by the, the congressional delegation, by the PPP, and the delegation didn't have a single indo -Guyanese. It's recognized everywhere in the world now, everywhere, that the only multi-ethnic party in this country by support and by practice is the People's Progressive Party. This party here, which is the headquarters here today, the only one by policies, by practice, and by philosophy, uh, uh, and by its history. We're the only multi-ethnic party in this country. We don't put together. They, for, for the APNU, listen to David Hines again. David Hines said the only, the only reason Ramjatan and Nagamotu were part of the coalition is to bring a, a few Indian votes over to us. That's their only, he said they serve only one purpose. And I saw Rick Ford Burke when he realized that like it was being recorded, he ran to the 
ran to the um, to the the phone that was recording the comment. This was in a private meeting that they had, but it's in the public domain now. That is how you you see it. So this we need to confront this issue in in a frontal manner. This racism issue. And, and we are prepared, as I said before, to show on our track record that when we're in office, all the people benefited from, from, from the PPP's torture. The whole country makes progress. And we work for all of our people, regardless of their race, their religion, their class. They all make progress. That's the philosophy of the party. We now know which is the, the racist party. In, in the country. Um, we, we have seen today, I, I, I wanted to go through a number of other issues, but we're going to have many chances of doing so. Um, I wanted it to be purely party because we can have another press conference to deal with government issues. But I'm, we in the People's Progressive Party, we are getting ready. We have already been assessing candidates across the country. Um, we haven't decided on, on any um, firmly. The executive of the party will meet before this, the, maybe in the next couple of weeks to look at all the candidates. We are in consultation now across the country, so settling uh, many areas. I can, I can say that there are a number of people who are formerly APNU members and councillors who are, have expressed a desire to, to be part of our list and our campaign. We welcome everyone. Um, we may not be able to accommodate everyone on our list of candidates, but many have pledged to work for the, the party. We are hoping that in the city and other areas like New Amsterdam, areas that we've never controlled before, Linden, that people recognize that since independence, these areas have been controlled by APNU administrations, PNC administrations, with very little support for the people in the, in the, in the, that they serve. So in the city, we have a council that just collects taxes and spends the money on itself. Although roads, drainage, garbage collection, um, repair of municipal facilities, all of these things fall under the city council. They've done none of it. The, city, the, the central government fixes every road in the city now Every road in New Amsterdam, every road in Linden, they, because they don't do any of that, we have built a garbage site at a cost of over maybe $12 million for the city garbage to go to at Eccles. Um, we assist with drainage. Almost the whole city is taken over by the central government. If you look at the improvement programs now, it's all done by the central government. All the city council does here and in these other areas, they just, um, they just collect taxes and spend on themselves, on wages and salaries. So we are hoping to work to change all of this. The same level of dynamism and accountability that we brought at the national level, we can do so at these municipalities but we need to get an opportunity to. And so we'd be making our case to the citizens of the city and the other communities, these areas, not to vote on the basis of history, but to vote on the basis of track record. That is what we have been arguing for. The manifesto, people who have made progress in the area, not a parking meter scandal, like, like you know what they, they had in the city, but who will put real parking for the citizens of the city, a project that we are embarked upon shortly 
with concrete drains to the city and a whole range of other improvement programs, and not just the city, but right across the country. So we are we're getting ready for these local government election campaign, but I want you to, the citizens of the country, to look at the trend. The trend is to have the fossils reemerge. The gold surrounds, and every day there is a new statement. A new statement by someone who's suddenly concerned about accountability. Couldn't talk a gold Saran who was Auditor General for most of the 10 years when not a single audited account for the country was presented in the pre-92 period. He could have resigned if he had integrity. <clears throat> the job of the Auditor General is to audit the public accounts of the country. If you don't produce pu audited public accounts, you don't have a work job. So he sat there almost eight of the 10 years when no public accounts were presented for the whole country and didn't even resign, did resign, and, or if he had any integrity, he would have done that. Today, come to complain about this. Every single year from 92, to 2023, public accounts have been um, audited for this country from 1992. Prior to that, it was 1982 that audits were done, 10 years gap. And so I've, I've seen them in the past. You recall you, there, the AFC and everything else. I, I, I don't know where these individuals were when ministers were giving contracts to themselves. You recall that in the APNU period, when the $420 billion were spent without parliamentary approval, that Jordan spent money on a whole range of things, including capital budget, when there was no budget. It's unconstitutional. We had to fix it. We had to fix it. We didn't go and charge him because we're just tired. And all day long, we'd be running behind these people in court. And so we have, a, we have documented, where was he, where was Gulsaran when the $600 million was missing from the Durban Park project? And all of these issues. Suddenly, he appears again, election season. So please watch out for them. They would be in the newspapers every day. <clears throat> and let me make one thing clear. We went to the electorate of this country. We got their support. They voted for the PPP to fix power, to get the cost down, etc. We are accountable to the electorate of this country not to fringe or individuals who have vested interests, often to see nothing happens in this country because of their bitterness with the past, as I said before, the fossils of the past. And I'm sorry that I have to use these words, but I've seen them over and over manifesting themselves. These people will not give the young people of a, this country a break, their future, they're like, they're like a big, burden on our backs, not a progressive burden that you can carry that would ultimately yield better results, but something that just intended on slowing progress in the country when they have no, not a single bit of integrity. We've seen it with the GR, GHRA, all their docks are in a row, and then we found one, uh, quite a few docks that were not in a row. Many of the docks swam away. And now they're starting to switch. They issue a statement today to switch it. What about other organizations? What about other organizations? But their docks swam away. You know, all their docks were in a row. And then disingenuously trying to link it with the EITI, 
It has nothing to do with EITI. You shouldn't even be on EITI if you don't have transparency. You have a defunct organization. And I wonder, because they said they have audited statements, but these haven't been submitted to the registrar. If they don't have annual audited statements, how do we know how much money they collected over the years and what they expended it on and from whom they basically collected it? What's a source of income? It is that when you probe a little bit deeper, you find a lot of rot in these organizations and these individuals, a lot of rot. So today, I'm just saying that the People's Progressive Party we, and the government headed by Irfan Ali has remained, they have remained faithful to what we promised the electorate. They worked very hard in the past two and a half, three years to reorient this country and attract to prosperity away from the doom and gloom period of APNU where everything was a problem away from high taxation and no future for many industries and lack of, lack of jobs and loss of welfare to a country that is growing rapidly in all of its manifestations where more people are getting jobs so much so we have labor shortages in some skill areas now um, and, and the welfare has been expanded and within a short period of maybe two, two and a half years we will see a revolution in things like health care and the services provided to our people. That's where the resources are being spent and the effort is being focused. So we were extremely proud of our record and we are, we are getting ready for, for the campaign on local government elections. Thank you. You can just speak. I don't know if you need the microphone or you can just, okay, go on. So, so when the team, the cluster from Eccles Rambor came to us, they suggested him. And they, we, in principle, that was agreed to, all of the constituency candidates. But that still has to be received final approval at the party, party level until then. And in principle, it has been agreed to. That was a suggestion from the Eccles Ramsburg cluster that came up there. Huh? No, no, no. There were all the can constituency candidates. There were several constituents. No, 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 no. There were lots of suggestions there. So for that constituency, yes, for that constituency. But there are several constituencies. So that is what I'm wrapping up now because I'm having discussions with all the clusters. We have about 80 clusters around the country in each area. And in Georgetown, we even have more. We have about another in the city itself and maybe 15 clusters because there are 15 constituencies. And therefore, um, the suggestions have come in. We say, yes, in principle, these names are agreed to, or you've got to go back and change some names. And then once all of those are agreed to, we'll have one meeting with everyone to baptize it. I don't, want to, I don't want to comment on people's names at this point in time because that, I've seen that in the public domain too. That is why I commented on this issue. 
but I don't want to. When we launch our campaign, you will see the names. Um, we, there is a period, I think it's next month um, in April, the names have to be submitted, the nominations have to be made. So at that time you will see the campaign launch. Um, what are you Sure. All right, you made a point, yes, so I don't need uh, more. So we give each of the clusters a list of criteria that a party would like to see in the candidates. So they must have adequate time to, to go to the meeting, they have to be faithful to the manifesto of the area. Um, and one of the, the criteria is that they m will not be able to tender for contracts in the NDC in which they are councillors. So if you intend to tender in that area, in the NDC where you're a councillor, do not put your name on the list because for the first time now, we are prohibiting that from happening because we have had a few instances in the past where we found that some of the councillors were tendering for contracts in their own NDCs or municipalities. And so there is a prohibition now that we said to the people that was one of the criteria. Do not put your name forward if you intend to do this. So that is it. But they can, because this is a big country, you can tender anywhere else because you're not in control there, but not in the NDC in which you're running. At all, in all constituencies, um, in all local government bodies, bodies, yes. Yeah, so we, we discussed this at the executive, the timeline is towards the end of the year or early next year. We came out, we came out of the COVID period and so the COVID period was one of those two. Yes. So we're not one to, to gloat about what likely outcomes will be. Um, we believe in working hard for all of these communities. So we are, our biggest concern is complacency. Our biggest concern is complacency in, in the base, in the party's base, because people believe that we will win the elections already. And in some areas where there is no other party contesting. So you just have one party basically contesting in the area. You have a low turnout, extremely low turnout. So turnout at local government elections has always been a factor in the elections. But no doubt the PPP will will do well in these elections, extremely well. I didn't get that, it's a bit muffled, yeah.
No. So in the last elections, we said where possible in 2018 that we were going for a model with 50% civic and 50% PPP members. So that's the rough guidance to our, our um, the, the clusters. So in some areas you may have a few more party members than the 50%, and in some areas you have more civic than 50%, and less, uh, you know, party members less than 50%. So that has always been the model. PPP civic. These are people who don't have membership cards. They want to contribute to the community. They, they want to make a difference. They're welcome as part of the PPP civic. And at the national level too. Even now, we have at the national level, we have had an influx of people wanting to join the party, young people particularly, and a lot of them are coming into the party and a lot of young people who want to be part of the civic. So they don't political oriented, but they like our program, they like where the country is going, and so they want to be part of the civic too. And so they're accommodated. Our model is a, a big model. Um, it, it, it's all, we allow that, this to happen. Hi, um, yes, please. Good afternoon. No, mainly party today. Party, party usually. Um, so, what I, I've not read. I've not read what Ramkaran said, but clearly, we people when they talk about inclusive governance, they're speaking about power sharing. I think ultimately they're talking about it. And so, when I was president, we did a, a paper that was launched towards inclusive gov governance building trust towards inclusive governance. But if you examine the constitutional changes that were made and signed into law when I was president, it has made us one of the most inclusive countries in the world in terms of governance. First of all, let me go back through these provisions because sometimes People forget them, that there was a different era, a different type of constitution versus the one we have today. Under the Burnham Constitution, the parliament was managed by the party in power with the speaker. In the new constitution, the, we have a parliamentary management committee with five persons on both sides and the speaker chairs it. So that's the first feature. That's a new constitution that I signed into law in the early 2000s. So that changed radically the way parliament now is governed. Five, five plus one, the speaker chairs that. In, in the new constitution, it has five rights commissions. To sit on the Rights Commission, you have to have two-thirds vote from the National Assembly on the organizations. So that means bipartisan support. No party controls two-thirds of the votes in the parliament. So bipartisan collaboration 
to put together the Five Rights Commission. Indigenous people, ethnic relations, human rights, um, gender, and, and uh, what's the other one? You, you media, you can't remember? Or your old age? Ethnic relations, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm no, I'm, I'm, yeah. The indigenous people, children, oh, children, the rights of the child, the children. So these are the five. Gender, children, indigenous people, human rights, ethnic relations, five. So that means collaboration to put together five commissions. The commissions often have powers of sanction over the executive. You tell me which constitution in the Commonwealth has those commissions and with the, the, such powerful commissions. The Ethnic Relations Commission can prohibit a political party from contesting elections if they use race as a mobilizing factor. Which constitution in the world has that? So those are the five commissions. That is inclusive governance too, at the parliamentary level. We then establish the four standing committees. Human rights, um, the social services, economic services, foreign affairs, and natural resources. Four, in the United States, the party that has the majority heads all the committees, the standing committees. In this case, we said two will be chaired by the government, two by the opposition, and then you switch the chairmanship. That's inclusive governance too. There at the parliamentary level. We put in place the procurement commission. You know how you have to compose this. Collaboration between the two parties. I can go on and on. There are about eight or nine other features. These are all to promote inclusive governance. But that was not, that was not this, nobody is satisfied with that. Although we have gone beyond most countries in the world to put in place this system for inclusive governance and to put in place not just an institutional mechanism to tackle racial discrimination, because you can go and report to the ERC and they, are, they have powers of sanction over the executive. People forget all of that. So when Ram Karan and the others write these are all features there. In the, in the appointment of the Chancellor and the Chief Justice, we said you have to have the agreement of the leader of the opposition. Look what happened now. Look what happened. We changed it from just consultation to agreement because you want it to, be, to promote inclusive governance, the two sides collaborating. You have gridlock there. So I suspect that this new form of inclusive governance that they're talking about only has one, one end, that is executive power sharing. But our point was, if you can't share a common set of values, if you believe in stealing elections and we don't, we can't get along well. If you don't share economic values and other social values or, or patriotism, or if you don't, if you're racist, then you can't work with us on this. You have to, to share common values for that to work, or else you bring the same gridlock that we have in the parliament now into the cabinet, and nothing ha happens. We've seen it. It has stymied many countries. And so that you have to build, have a period of building trust, and only then you can have that happen. But there's no building trust. In fact, we're going further apart because every day APNU pushes only one agenda, races, racism agenda. And they're unwilling to acknowledge and say, we support free, open, democratic elections. They would say it in words, but not really subscribe to it. Those are two fundamental things that have to, to change before you can work together. And so we're open to that. You're absolutely right that we said in our manifesto that when the constitutional reform is in place and the consultations start taking place, we're open to anything, including the model change at GCOM. 
um, with, but we, we need to safeguard elections, a model that safeguards elections and free and fair elections. And two, if there's a proposal there that comes out about some form of executive power sharing and it has resonance with the people, maybe you'll have to go to a referendum or something of that sort. But right now, it's just all, we have made serious efforts in this party to have an institutional framework that put, promotes greater collaboration and go governance, inclusive governance. No country in the Caribbean or in the Commonwealth, I would say, or even for it of you, have that, those features in their constitution. You show me one country that has gone as far as we have gone. But sometimes we don't even recognize what we have done ourselves because the, the so-called analysts would never want to talk about that. They would never want to talk about that because the, you know why? That will bring credit to the PPP, that it was the PPP that initiated this process of constitutional reform and that we signed it into law. We signed it into law. The new constitution. Yes. I think the police get intimidated by all of these calls. Oh, the police have to act impartially. Nobody, if they breach the law, then they must, the police have to act swiftly on these matters that can cause a rift among our people. We have to fight racism with every bit of tool that we have in this country. That's the only way this country can have a sustainable future. We have to fight racism. We have given, equipped the police with a tool. They have the Racial Hostility Act. They have a whole range of tools at their disposal. They have to move swiftly and not be intimidated and have to prove, oh, they're acting impartially or partially, like what Norton is accusing them of. Norton deliberately accuses the police for, of being partisan because he wants them to, to get onto the back foot. So that they're cautious, they tiptoe around these issues, and they would not take condign action against these individuals so that they can continue to perpetrate their illegalities. Look at Norton with a straight face saying they continue to occupy illegally the office that doesn't belong to them in Letem. Today, he said that. Oh, we are still occupying the office. This is just like how he said he, he had the SOPs and he can't produce them now, but he got them in his back pocket. And hear what he said. We wanted, the reason why we wanted to throw them out because he had 11 barrels of, of clothing or something there and he was going to give it to the Amerindians and he would get some support from them because of this. Read, read it, please read it for me. You would see how stupid it looks. When they had all the money in the world, they took away from the Amerindians uh, 2,000 jobs. That is about $700 million a year because that each of those 1,972 persons was earning $30,000 a month multiplied by 30 times 12 months in the year. And you'll come up with over 700. They took it all away. And now he wants to give them 11 barrels of old clothing. And that is what the PPP was upset with. And we had to go and show them out of the office because of his 11 barrels of old cloth that he has down there. This is the ridiculousness of an opposition leader. You know, and, and with impunity. So he's saying these things. He's concerned about, um, about the police and the partisan nature, and he has something to release on the police. Release it. 
If you had it, we'd love to. If there's any illegality committed by the police, they too must face the law. They too must face consequences. If you have anything they're doing illegally, please, we'd be happy if you release it because it helps us to, to better manage the situation there. You, 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 which organization you're from? Kaichur, of course, Kaichur. I'm not dealing with, I'm not dealing with that again. You have to, this obsession and the lies you all keep telling uh, every day uh, on this sector. Anyhow, we are, we're dealing with that matter. My next press conference, I deal with that. I don't want to get bogged down in that now again. I'll deal with that at my, the state press conference when I have that about all the transparency issue. And, you, and since I'm on a political issue, you should ask the owner of Kaicho News when I'm getting my apology for, for saying to me that he could get within two weeks a company that would supply us um, and give us a long-term power purchase agreement at three cents per kilowatt hour. I even said five cents. Up to now, four months have passed, and he promised to publicly apologize and put it in the front page of his paper because he was talking crap, nonsense, pure nonsense. And he does that often, and, gets, and the nonsense gets reflected every single day in the newspapers, the nonsense. Until now, I'm waiting for that because that was a political issue. He should, he should by now because they love to talk about, oh, renewable energy, we can go solar. He was saying he could do it in solar. Well, give us a solar contract at, at five cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so so that, that's my political bit on that. But we'll come back to the other issues there. I see. Yes. No, that's not a strategy. I'm saying that we are contesting everywhere. We'll fight a hard campaign in every single one of these areas. But I'm saying that there are some areas where we have never won these areas. And we are hoping politically that people will give us an opportunity in these areas to prove that we can Put, put together a stronger development plan and implement it than they have ever done. So one greater accountability in the city council, greater accountability and stewardship of the funds of the city council. That once there is greater accountability and increased flow of money to the city council itself, because right now there is no accountability there. So you give them money for one thing, they spend it for something else. Often it's something that doesn't bring benefits to the people of this country uh, so, or, the, or the city. So greater accountability and more focus on development. The group in the city hall, they're not focused on development. It's, a, it's an attitude, it's a mindset. If you're focused on development, like when I drive down the road now, this morning I'm driving down, I see Kitty coming through. I can see about 10 di different sets of problems because every day you are focused on solving problems. I come up the East Coast, I see people building, building driveway right onto the public road. 
We got to talk to people on them. You can't come on to the, a four-lane highway just like that. Those kinds of things, those people drive fast. They don't see it. It's a mindset that you have for development. And they don't have that mindset. P PNC doesn't have it. So, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't get that point. Sorry. You, you. The last election results took five months mm -hmm. to attain. Has the DPP expressed the GCOM an interest in a timeline for election results? So, as you know, there is a new law now, Representation of the People Act. If the law was amended, and the law now creates a set of, in fact, let me just say this, change that. So what it does, it allows less capricious behavior on the part of the GCOM staff, particularly the chief elections officer. So starting from registration, all the way to the declaration of results. We've identified <coughs> publicly and we had consultations on every problem that we have experienced, not just in these elections, but in previous elections. And we have sought through the new law to plug those loopholes. So how registration is done, the transparency surrounding registration, how preparation of elections would be done. So for example, a training, a manual has to be prepared by the chief elections officer, submitted to all the political parties before the elections, the media, and published in the media. So we then know exactly what the role of each of the, age, the, the officials at the polling place will be. So what are, what's the role and the responsibilities of the, the presiding officer, the party agent, etc. So when, for example, the last, we had the boxes on the East Coast where Mingo changed the instructions and said to those people, don't put some of the documents in the boxes, but for the rest of the country, those documents were in the boxes. And then APNU, they carried, the presiding officers carried those documents, gave it to Mingo directly. Then APNU complained, where are those documents? They're missing. So now, in the manual, it will say, you have, these are the documents. Ten documents here are documents that have to be in the box. The others will remain with the party agents or with the presiding officer. So you don't have any room for capricious behavior. Everybody would have a copy of the manual. They will do, they'll do this. How con counts are conducted. So in the same law, I'm just jumping a little bit. So once the, the elections are held and we have statements of four, before the count starts at the, the regional level, like Mingo's level, the, with the RO, all of the statements of poll have to be published. So you as citizen, you as citizen, you could have your calculator. And you could even before the, the tabulation is done at the RO level, you'd have all the statements of poll. You can then do your own calculations. You will see who won the elections, like what the parties do. Like on the night, by five in the morning, I knew we won the elections because we were going through all night, going through the, the results they were being called in, some of the statements of poll being faxed. I knew by 5 a.m. in the morning that we won the election. So the country will know that long before they start tabulating. So if anybody tries to sneak in something different, 
then you're going to have big trouble at the, when the RO is tabulating. So those kinds of things are in the place. You have to establish polling places. So we said how polling places will be established. So you have to, within a certain boundary, you have to have a polling place based on physical distance and number of people. So you can't, like the night before, you remember what the issue we had at Fowles, that they wanted the voters from Fowles to come all the way into paradise, miles and miles away to vote. It would have been impossible. At the night, almost the night before the elections, we got that change. And they had to build tents in Fowles to, for people to vote there because people will not travel very far distances to vote and you, you know, they wanted that to happen. So a, a, a chief elections officer cannot now say, you know, I'm gonna use the establishment of polling places to disenfranchise people or to make great hardships for them to vote. All of this is in the new law now. So we expect the new law would be observed faithfully. I, uh, this question is often asked, and I, I'm, I'm very proud of how far our discipline services have come in terms of professionalism. If you look at the early period, almost the entire leadership of the PNC, um, the Army, came through the YSM which was the youth arm of the PNC. There was political recruitment. The army, as we know now, was used to steal the ballot boxes. I saw that as a boy myself. Yeah. Soldiers come in at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, carried away the boxes. Um, they threw the polling agents out so they couldn't follow the boxes. So that's documented. And over the years, we've worked very hard. The 20 odd years in the army, um, in office, to move our soldiers and the army away from supporting a party to being faithful to the constitution of this country and to the Defense Act. And I must say, I'm very proud of that evolution because people may support parties individually and people, anybody is free to vote, whether you're a soldier or a policeman or whomever you want to. But as an institution, these institutions have grown enormously. And so it wasn't for it wasn't that there wasn't provocation and attempts to get the army to play a role in the 2020 elections. There were many PNC leaders who were urging the army leadership to take a partisan position and to intervene. And the army did not. They stood up professionally. And so, whilst there were elements in the police force who were partisan and part of the plot to, to steal the elections, as the COI demonstrated, there were many people with integrity in the police force who stood up against that plot. 
So as an institution, the police force has performed professionally. There are many individuals who have not performed professionally. And those people, they have no place in similar institutions, in, in the police or the army. Shouldn't be there. People should remain faithful to the constitution of this country or to the, the act under which they operate. And so the composition, the ethnic composition of the army has not changed, but they have demonstrated professionalism. Professionalism. And, and so the experience of Guyana is one that we should really be proud of. Because when they sought to make it about ethnic issues, we had Bartland, Scotland, an afro guyanese prominent afro guyanese uh, person who stood up against APNU, although he was named by APNU as a speaker. He stood up when they tried to get him to change his position on the no confidence motion. And it was the Chief Justice of Guyana, not an afro guyanese wom woman, who also ruled that the, the no confidence vote was valid and ruled throughout the election process when, um, when there was an attempt to steal the elections, gave the, the injunction. And then uh, the, the, the army and the police, made up mainly of afro -Ghanese. So it's, it's a proud kind of thing. This is the country that we live in, and we should really be proud of, of ourselves because people try to make us out as basket case, a basket case. All of those who come abroad and the few naysayers that uh, someday that we're going to trigger each other. We, we've lived together. We've overcome slavery, indentureship. We have worked together, lived together. We have a common future in this country. And, and in spite of all the provocations and the divisions. And so every time these guys, that's all they want, race to, to split us, pull us apart again. And, and there are people who have stood up and they have integrity and they act professionally. So for me, the police and the army as institutions, they're, they're professional bodies and we hope that they remain so. We we'll do everything to encourage a growth in professionalism. Um, it, it's, it's getting our people more qualified and all of that. And, but, but on this matter, they need to act condignly with some of these individuals who are breaking the law. Yes, fair, fair, fair. Oh, that's what we need to step up. We need to step up. Um, that's we are dealing with people in a manner that is is like harsh, but in accordance with the law. You hopefully would send the right signal that this this sort of behavior, the intermediary behavior, will not be tolerated. And that's what we need to do. We need to send um, a strong message that people will have the freedom in this country that is enshrined and given to them by our constitution. And that the state and the government will protect those freedoms. Freedom to, to protest, freedom to speak freely and to contest against the government. But when they cross thresholds, then they can claim freedom of speech, like what Norton is saying. Freedom of speech, the man has freedom of speech. 
he crossed the line here. I, can, I have freedom of speech to say Norton is the worst leader ever in the history of the PNC. And so that's my, me exercising freedom of speech. But I can't, I can't say it, go and harm Norton because that is an incitement. It's wrong. There, and, and, and even on the police thing. So I'm, I'm pleased because I've seen a lot of issues with the latest report, um, the, the State Department report. That was recent, and I've seen a lot of spin on that, everybody doing the spin. So, so what I did, I just looked through quickly, and I've seen Mr. Nandalal issue a statement about some factual errors in the report. And there are many factual errors, and we will correct them. Um, they, for example, the APA has now complained to the US that they can't meet ministers now to talk about the land titling activity. But the APA was part of the APNU coalition because the head of the APA was the deputy leader of their list. And it was the APA that was undermining Amerindian land rights by agreeing that with Granger that Amerindian land rights would fall under the, the commission, the Land Reform Commission, the commission that we've had. It was the PPP and the, and the National Two Shows Council, but led mainly by the PPP that opposed this. So Granger had to reverse course, but he didn't, he didn't call the, the ethnic, um, the Tushaus Council to speak with them. He called in the APA as state house when he reversed course, but we fought it off. It was the PNC, the co their coalition partner, the APA coalition partner, that kept, they dismantled the Amerindian land titling unit, where we had left 10.2 million US dollars to continue Amerindian land titling. When we got into office, we resumed Amerindian land titling. And they went to the US and complain, and it's in the report that they can't meet us now to discuss Amerindian land titling. We're not discussing this with APA. APA has no standing there. It is the villages. That's where the discussions are taking place. And we now pass, we passed a law that outlined a process through which you apply and you get secure your titles. So we don't need to discuss that with the EPA, APA, we need to do that. So there are many factual errors in the report and we intend to correct those. But there are one, there are a number of definitive statements made by the State Department report that when taken as a whole, you would see the characterization of this government. So what, number one, it says the government took steps to identify, prosecute, and punish officials who committed human rights abuses or engaged in corruption. That's a definitive statement by the State Department report. I read it back. The government took steps to identify, prosecute, and punish officials who committed human rights abuses or engaged in corruption. Two, there were no reports of disappearances or on or by or on behalf of the government. Three, members of both ethnicities held senior leadership positions of the government. So they are saying that in the government, they were talking about afro guyanese and indo guyanese that the two parties are um, they primarily their support come from indo guyanese and afro guyanese but they made a definitive statement. Members of both ethnicities held senior leadership positions in the government. Four, several domestic human rights groups generally operated without government restriction. Five, there are no reports of political prisoners or detainees. Six, independent news media were active and expressed a wide variety of views without restrictions. 
that those are key issues. Press freedom, no political prisoners. You have people of every race in the government. The government punishes, investigates and punishes people for human rights, abuse, and, and, and corruption. These are strong, definitive statements made in that report. So they're nitpicking, oh, the APA complaint here and stuff. That we're not concerned about the complaints too much because we have answers to those. These are the key messages from that report. That's it. Well, thank you for being here today.